Hello, I'm Atuba George and I'm so blessed to be bringing God's truth to you today. Praise God. Woo. Can we call for that daily bread? Are you ready? Because I've got a lot to say to you today. Say, Father, I demand right now my daily bread is coming to me in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. All right. Yesterday I was sharing something. Which, you know, I was talking about the covenants that God made with Abraham. So we're talking about tithing and how God made a covenant with Abraham and why we call it a covenant. Many people don't realize it was a covenant. They just thought it was a command. Hey, Abraham, you must tithe. A command is not a covenant. A covenant is different from a command. In a covenant, there will be commands. See? But a covenant is stronger. See? So yesterday I was showing. You know, how Melchizedek met Abraham. And I was trying to show you that Melchizedek was not a physical king. And so we're looking at the book of Hebrews. And so here in the book of Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 3, it says, without talking about Melchizedek or Melchizedek, depends on how your tongue is, praise God. So it says, without father, without mother, without genealogy. You know what that means? We can't trace his lineage where he came from so more like going to ask did you guys which all the royal families is there any son like melchizedek no what kind of name is that <laughs> so if you say he was a king which family did he come from they couldn't trace okay so where are his children they couldn't trace so it says without genealogy having neither beginning of days nor end of life so they don't know when he was born they don't know when he died are you following me now but made like the son of god remains a priest continually so now he concluded that melchizedek was made like the son of god and i was explaining to you why he said melchizedek was made like the son of god because in, 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 in those days, you know, um, like I was telling you the, the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were thrown into the fire. And King Nebuchadnezzar looked and said, hey, how many people did we throw into the fire? He said, three. Three, right? Say, yeah, because I thought that was much. He said, but how come I'm seeing four people there? And then he said something. He says, and the fourth man is like unto the Son of God. That wasn't a vision he was seeing. That was real. There was a fourth man in that fire. I call Labranda does in our life. There was a fourth man in that fire. Who was the fourth man in that fire? Was it an angel? No, it wasn't an angel. It's the same description of who Melchizedek is. Notice here, it says, Mage but made like the Son of God. And that's the best description they could describe him. Why did he say? And then I want you to understand something also. These writings were writings that were done far after Jesus, okay? Praise God. Yes. And also, um, the book of Daniel... I want you to understand me. The book of Daniel that you read, the translation was done far even after Jesus. Are you getting what I'm telling you? Yes. So, because you want to ask yourself, okay, how, how did they, how did Nebuchadnezzar know the Son of God? Because you think it's only those who saw Jesus or after Jesus that can actually refer to someone and say, the son of God. But Nebuchadnezzar said, the, the, the fourth man is like unto the son of God. Now, what was he talking about? Like I said, the translation was done after Jesus, okay? So, now, they could say that because they understood or they understand the son of God. And when they say, like the son of God. I will tell you what they mean. They are talking about Jesus after his resurrection. Because they knew 
that after the resurrection of Jesus, his operation changed. He, he began to show up and disappear. That's how Jesus was operating after his resurrection. So they could, the disciples can be in a room like this and suddenly Jesus will appear like, oh, master, you're here. <laughs> He's not going to knock the door and say, oh, open the door. They, they couldn't follow him to his house anymore after his resurrection. So they didn't know where he was staying. Yes. So they knew, the disciples of Jesus knew that that's how Jesus was. And that's their general, that's what they shared concerning him. I mean, we can just be here like this, Jesus would just come, just like, oh. and, and each time he showed up, he showed up in a different form. Different face. <laughs> Imagine he showed up as a white man and next time he showed up as a... Of course, I'm, I, I'm sure he must have showed up all like a you know, Jewish person that they can all relate with, not like a foreigner. You know, you know what I mean by that? But that's to tell you something, that when he said here, yeah, he was made like unto the Son of God. He was saying, Melchizedek just appeared. That's what he was saying. So, this is how they got to the conclusion that Melchizedek was. And I told you, now, this is what I say. Uh, it, it's not written anywhere. Uh, you know, but I tell you, take it or leave it. I know I'm telling you the truth. Melchizedek was the word of God made flesh. So, when he says it was made, the one who appeared in the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego is the word of God made flesh yes so he, he showed up in the fire with them and by his appearing the fire did not hurt any of them okay so melchizedek was the same jesus after his resurrection that's how he operated the word of god made flesh so whenever he wants to communicate with them he comes in flesh and shares with them and that's how Jesus is still this very day. So, so I tell you the truth, Jesus can show up. He can show up right in front of you. <laughs> I don't think you'll see a white man. Those pictures you've seen, just be expecting him to be like that. No, sir. He can show up like a Nigerian. Oh, yes, he can show up like a Nigerian. And have fellowship with you and leave. So, and that's why sometimes, you know, um, people who have had such encounters, not visions now, real encounters with the Lord, when they share with you, say, Jesus came to my room. He sat on this chair. And when you tell them, describe him, um, he was, then another person who had the same experience, describe him, you wonder if they are talking about the same person. Yes, they are talking about the same person. But he doesn't show up. He can show up as a, as a black man to you. And, and he can show up to someone in America as a white man. The same Jesus. <laughs> Why? Because he is the word of God made flesh. Please get that in your mind. So now he showed up to Abraham. And he came with bread and wine. Where did he get the bread and wine from? He didn't go buy it in the market or from a shop while he was, you know, coming to see Abraham. So, oh, we need bread and wine. Let's go buy. No, he didn't buy. He came. He, he, I called me enough for each kapar. So you see that bread and that wine, they were eternal things. And they represented one thing. I'll feed you. I'll take care of you. That's what he came to do. He came to show to Abraham. I'll feed you. I'll take care of you. Now remember, it has been a principle with God that man shall live by every word that proceeds from his mouth. Right from when man was created, that was the deal God had concerning the sustenance of so now Melchizedek shows up with bread and wine. And then he says, hey, come. I'm entering a covenant with you. 
that I'm going to be responsible for your life and for that of your children. And God says, now this is what you are going to do. You are going to take a tenth of everything that you have. You know, some people have said the goods Abraham was holding, they were not his own. They were his own. Now those goods were the spoils of war. Who went for the war? Abraham and his partners. They went for that war. They captured everything. So those were spoils of war. So legally, they belonged to Abraham and he could have done whatever he chose to do with them. No one would have held him um, accountable for it. So when Melchizedek met him, he says, Abraham, I want to enter into a covenant with you. And so here's the covenant. You are going to give a tenth of everything. Now that represented every segment of his life. Okay, so you will give it to me and then I will give you what I brought, bread and wine. So the moment they exchanged those things, a covenant was cut. And Abraham was instructed to teach his children after him these things. How do you know? Where is it written in the Bible that he was instructed? You see your problem now. See your problem? It's not written. Ah, so you cannot say, because it's not written, you cannot say that he was commanded to instruct them. Hey, may the Lord give you understanding. Because this same Abraham, you find God boasting about him later on and say, for I know him. He will command his children and his household after him so that they will keep the way and the commands of the Lord to do justice and the right thing, so that I will bring to pass the things that I have said concerning Abraham. What do you understand from that? The word of God being fulfilled in Abraham's life is dependent on Abraham teaching his children. So God will not expect that from him if he has not instructed him to do so. That's number one. Number two, now this is, this is where you apply spiritual intelligence, even when you study the scriptures. Number two, you find Jacob, not Isaac. You find Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, being in a situation where he had an encounter with God. And when he came out of that encounter and realized this was God that visited me, what did he say? He said, look, of all that you give me, I will give a tent. Where did he get that from? He got it from his grandpa. Now, Jacob met Abraham. See, they were, they, were, they were not babies. They had come a bit of age before Abraham died. Now, you all just need to calculate the age. And you know that. And so, Abraham taught Jacob, meaning he must have taught Isaac. Now, here people say, Abraham only paid tight once. Who told you he only paid tight once? You assume he paid tight once. Now then, <clears throat> so they had this meeting and they settled this fact that, hey, this is a covenant. Give me a tent of everything that's why abraham went around everything that was you know when you read the book of genesis you read the story in genesis it was as though melchizedek just showed bless me abraham of the most high god possessor of heaven and earth you know and, and he gave me a title of all and then he left no they had a serious meeting they had a feast during that meeting yes they did in that wilderness And, and he, Abraham understood what that covenant was. He knew exactly what it was. And then immediately they were done. Guess what Melchizedek did to Abraham? He said, Abraham, say, yes, sir. He said, now, stand up. He stood up. He said, lift up your hand. He lifted up. He said, now, I don't want you to take any of all these things. Why? He said, because... 
We are in covenant now, and I want to be responsible for your wealth. I don't want anybody to lay claim that you became rich because of them. But, yeah, I know. So what do I do? You're going to give everything to the king of self. <laughs> but, Abraham, I'm in covenant with you right now. Yeah. So that's what you're going to do. The covenant starts now. You know, at that point, you want to say, can we start after now, please? No, he says, now. All right, I'm going to do it. Abraham, yes, sir. Lift up your hand before me. Say after me. I, I, Abraham, Abraham, will not take even a shoelace from this thing. Now, that means there were shoes. And the shoes had laces. I'm trying to tell you that they paid tight of all. They paid tight of shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because he said, I will not take even a shoelace. See that now? Abraham said, all right, I'll do it. And then Melchizedek left. Then there comes Abraham meeting the king of Sodom. And the king said, wow, thank you so much. You've done so well. I mean, I, I, you didn't have to bring all these goods. You can keep the goods and, and just give us our wives and our children. That's the right thing to do. It was normal. It wasn't a special favor. That's a normal thing to do. And Abraham said, no. Ah, why? Because I have lifted up my hand. I call the shkit that I give God. Let's, let's read that quickly. I know we're running out of time, but I, I need to show you that. Because I call the shkit that I give God. Verse Genesis chapter 14, verse 21. Watch this now. Now the king of Sodom said to Abraham, Give me the persons and take the goods for yourself. But Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, the possessor of heaven and earth that I will take nothing from a thread to a sandal strap, and that I will not take anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abraham rich. Did you see that? Now, follow me here. You see, when Melchizedek met him, he brought bread and wine, and look at what he said. He said, verse 19, same chapter, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High. Take note of that phrase. Blessed be Abraham of the Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth. That's the salutation God Melchizedek brought to Abraham. He said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High, who is the possessor of heaven and earth. Mm. Now you find Abraham saying here, I have raised my hand to the Lord God Most High, the possessor of heaven and earth. Now, who do you think? Are you understand what I'm saying? Who do you think, or when do you think Abraham made this vow, raising up his hands? When he met Melchizedek. Because he used the same words Melchizedek used. I have lifted up my hand to the Lord Most High. Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be Abraham of the Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. I have lifted up my hand to the Lord Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. Now, why did Melchizedek greet Abraham with that name? I'll tell you. Because now he's coming into covenant with him. And he's going to bless him. Hello, bread. He's going to bless him with everything. For him to bless him with everything, he has to come with the authority to bless him. The authority means he owns it. 
And you understand what I'm saying? He owns it. So he's going to bless Abraham because he owns it. So he said, hey, Abraham, you are entering into covenant with the Lord Most High. Not just the Lord Most High. When he said the Lord Most High, oh, the Lord Most High, the one who's so high up there. No one comes to us. He said, he's the possessor of heaven and earth. Woohoo! Now this is the reason Peter tells us he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. Why? Because he owns it. Are you understanding now? So Melchizedek came to Abraham and said, ah, you're going to be blessed with heavenly things. You're going to be blessed with earthly things. I cobra ask it. So that's why it was so important. I said, Abraham, you've got to do away with this because they will become a limitation to your mind from receiving the thing that God wants to give you. He made it so big in the mind of Abraham. That's why Hebrews tells us that Abraham looked for a city with foundations whose builder and maker was God. He understood the covenants that he entered into with Melchizedek. He understood it. And he was never going to joke with it. We got into this covenant. So when he says, don't take anything from that king. So when Abraham came to the king, he think, no, no, I've gotten, I've sworn before the Lord Mosai, the possessor of heaven and earth. The moment he said that, he just made little of those things. They became so minute. I mean, I, I'm in business with the possessor of heaven and earth. <laughs> What's all these things that I'm going to hold on to? Thank you, Lord Jesus. This is how the tithe covenant was cut. God is bound to bless Abraham. As long as Abraham tithes. See, the blessing comes first. Then the tithe comes as a response from Abraham. The time is up. I'm going to continue tomorrow. May the Lord give you understanding to these things. Jesus. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.